Welcome, welcome. Once again here, we are Worldview TV Talk Show. I am your guest host, the Reverend Dale Smith. What a great, great, great time it is. I'm here with a phenomenal guest, um, one of the great men of God, um, scholar, author, great thinker. We are here today, we're honored here today to be with the Reverend Dr. Demetrius S. Carolina. So great to see you, sir, as always. Wonderful. Glad to be here. Glad to be here with you again. Yes, sir. And thank you for asking me here. Well, thank you. It's our honor, sir. So, as we all know, you are world renowned, but for those few people that don't know who you are, could you tell us a little about yourself? Certainly. I, I am the executive director of the Central Family Life Center, one, one of the largest black and brown nonprofits in the borough of Staten Island, the uh, senior pastor of the First Central Baptist Church in uh, Stapleton, Staten Island, New York, professor at two or three universities, and father of four beautiful children and husband of one extraordinary woman, my lovely wife, Jacinia. Man, great, great, great. Well, last time we were together, um, Dr. Carolina, mm -hmm. we talked about quite a few subjects. I thought it was a phenomenal show, but on this particular show, we're going to delve a little deeper into urban apologetics, mm -hmm. defending the faith in an urban setting which is a little different for those of us that come from the black church tradition. One of the questions has um, been on the mind that many times people from the African diaspora feel as though that Christianity is not a black person's religion, black man's religion, when in fact, though, we know there's Asian African Christianity has been here forever since the beginnings of times. So your thoughts on that and how we can basically educate and bring people aboard to let people know there's a, there's a worldwide religion. Your thoughts? Religion in and of itself is anthropomorphic. That is simply to say that we view or our understanding of God tends to be um, honed from our own understanding of self. And living in a colonial, uh, colonialized uh, society where Eurocentric perspectives dominate the thinking Black and brown folks often don't see themselves in the ideologies of religiosity, right? We don't tend to see ourselves in the historic patterns of God, Jesus, Christ, uh, the, these, these thoughts of religion. Having said that, people are attracted to things for which they can see themselves in. And so it is our responsibility as religious leaders, black, white, or, 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 or something other than that, to speak uh, truth to power and to speak to the culture of the people to whom we are responsible. Jesus himself, when traveling on the uh, shores of Galilee from Judah, I think about the first uh, miracle that occurred some 90 miles north of Judah in, in Canaan of Galilee. Uh, he spoke to the customs and to the traditions of the culture. So when, when Jesus himself, who is our uh, prototype of what it is to be spiritual, what it is to be a minister, what it is to be a leader, can uh, acquiesce and speak to the modern day reality of people, then we who are religious leaders uh, should take note and follow suit and try to speak to to the to the realities in which our uh, people, the people whom we serve, speak. I just want to throw in parenthetically that those who are spiritual leaders are spiritual leaders to those who follow them. And if you cannot speak to the followers, then who are you leading? <laughs> right? It's a fiduciary responsibility, you see. Yes, sir. I often say this, and I think it's true. People who call themselves leaders and have no one following them, they're simply taking a walk. Mm -hmm. So if you can't speak to the people whom you are serving, then what, are you, what, what is your effectiveness? Mm -hmm. what, is, you know, what are you there for? So again, we have to speak to the culture, right? The hip-hop culture, to, to the, the millennial culture, mm -hmm. to the Gen Z culture, Right to the tech savvy culture, to the Facebook, to the YouTube, to the Twitter, right? uh, to the Snapchat culture, in order to capture them, 
to keep them and then to turn it over is another important point then to turn it over to them to lead the way because to no small extent leaders must be better at following yes, sir. and I know I'm leading you when you take on what it is that I give you and then and make it your own so then I can follow your lead does that make sense great sense and, and, and so, you have, so I got like a thousand questions after you said that mm-hmm. <laughs> so to that point and kind of double pronged with that said and you Bessie um, spoke to but I want you to particularly speak to those alternative religions a lot of people go into African religions um, of course the NOI Nation of Islam Nation of Gods and Earths and of course the Hebrew Israelites and many times they've gone that way as you also eloquently stated because of distortions of the whitewashing of Christianity, but then it goes the other opposite way, a blackwashing Christianity, or basically just destroying Christianity out the window. Your thoughts on that? So the bane, the, the, the crusk, the ethos of faith is humanity. The foundation of humanity is love. If and when we can lead from the theme and the mission of love, it delineates the power of these ultra perspectives, right? Culture, ethnicity, um, those are subsets of the human reality. We are all human beings. Jesus was not white. He certainly wasn't European. And Jesus was not black in that he was not African, um, African, uh, centric or, perspect- uh, or, or, or African centered. He was global. Certainly we know as we understand from all the scientific thought that the first man was created in uh, Tanzania or found in Tanzania, yes, sir. northern Africa. We must understand that persons even until today who are from that region have darker olive brown hue because that is a a reality of the climatic reality of of where they live. Mm -hmm. All cultures, all humans originate from Africa, Mm -hmm. Akibala the land of the dark people. And we then, through the Barren Straits, through other realities, traveled. Mm -hmm. At one point we believed that the earth was one solid, you know, Pangea, the thought and then traveled and then separated. Having said that, we are all human. You know, the, even the construct of, of one's ethnicity is a man-made construct, yes, sir. you know? That is not real in, in the sense of humanity, right? So of course, when we're dealing with power and dominance, culture, language, we then deal with those things that divide, that separate man-made con- constructs. When we deal with the divine, we deal with love. We deal with humanity. Now, it may be easier at first to separate, but long-term, those things that last, those are the things that require time, require a real understanding that you must have something bigger than you leading you to affect positive change for the majority of people. That doesn't come easy. Mm-hmm. It requires some study, it requires some time, it requires some patience, it requires a whole lot of energy, mm-hmm. but those are the things that last. Mm-hmm. So yes, there are um, factors, historic factors, especially living in the United States of America, where religion has been used to isolate, to denigrate, to enslave, to, uh, to perpetuate uh, myths and stereotypes that are the furthest thing from the truth from a biblical perspective, Absolutely. right? Mm-hmm. But it is also true that faith, that in and of itself can take two or three hours to talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, trust, hope, love, the, the fruit of the Spirit are the things that have kept us, mm-hmm. that have led us that have caused people who are white to go against societal trends and norms to help their black brothers, who 
folks that were black historically and oppressed and suppressed to rise above the Goliaths of the society and affect positive change that lasts well beyond the systemic racism, the systemic uh, barriers mm -hmm. that have kept masses of people down. Uh, the only man in the United States of America who ha is celebrates a, a, a federal holiday is an African-American man, Dr. King. Dr. King is not the only African-American who's done phenomenal things. And the fact of the matter is this country wouldn't be the superpower it is without uh, the, the labor, the sweat, the blood, the tears of the oppressed people who were brought here, the only group of people who were brought here against their will. Everyone else has come here because that's what they wanted to do for a better life. Africans were. And yet these are the same people who've never received reparations and, and other folks have. Even folks who have had heinous things happen to them on other shores who have come to America have received reparations for the behavior, the heinous, uh, cruel human uh, indignities that they faced in other lands. But these are realities that must be faced. They are not um, realities that are so comfortable, but they're embedded in our faith. They're embedded in our culture. They're embedded in our spiritual practices, and they must be addressed. I can, I can go on and on. Uh, the image of a white Jesus or a white savior is endemic of a colonial mindset, right? A Eurocentric uh, perspective of God, but of course, the dominant cultures have the ability to perpetuate certain images and certain stereotypes, right? However, it is also the case that there is a browning of America, which supersedes some uh, socio-political realities that we are grappling with in this nation today, with the swinging of the pendulum, if you will, Absolutely. of presidents. You know, the first black president in the history of this nation, which also uh, in many ways produced a Donald Trump, who at the very beginning was saying that this man, that is Barack Obama, wasn't even an American citizen or born here. So these, these, these extreme modalities of thought should and can also produce a moderate middle of the road reality for the masses. Mm -hmm. But it is also true that um, we tend to hear more from the, the extreme ideologies. <laughs> they, they tend to be much more verbal. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, it's almost like I say, if it, if, it, if it bleeds, it leads in the news, those extreme perspectives are what catches attention. Absolutely. And that's why they tend to ring louder. Doesn't make, because it's loud doesn't mean it's true, right? Because, it loud, because it's loud doesn't mean it's right. Is simply loud. Phenomenal um, answer. Um, again, it makes me think of this. With that said, Dr. Carolina, how could black church studies, mm. which is a subcategory of, of black African studies with black history, and it's coming up a little bit in prominence, but I think it's so needed in the community to answer and there's a lot of questions you so eloquently you know, expanded on. Do you feel that black church studies among even black churchgoers would expand the horizon and maybe give uh, tools to answer some of the loudness from others for ultra religions? So, so my answer to that is religion in, its, in, the, in, in a true sense, and maybe even a denotative sense, is practice, right? So when you think of religion, you think of what people and a group of people do on a regular basis. And if we're not careful, Jesus really taught and preached against religious modalities, hmm. right? Because when people practice something regularly, it becomes familiar to them. And sometimes familiarity can breed contempt. Being a follower of a faith, a faith tradition, requires you to be led by a faith, not simply by a practice, right? Why is that important? It is important because the needs of the people we serve change. 
And if we are steeped in tradition or in practices or in what makes us comfortable, we will miss the people hmm. that we serve. Absolutely. So our faith takes us into areas that aren't necessarily comfortable or familiar for us hmm. in order to address the needs of the people. At the church where I serve, the First Central Church, we also have an arm, which is the Central Family Life Center, right? So ministry is not Sunday morning. Yes, sir. Sunday morning is my time of worship to get fueled for the ministry that occurs Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, right? Mm -hmm. And that ministry requires me to do things differently every day. Yes, sir. Because the need is different every day, right? So when we talk about the black church in particular, we have to understand we're not talking about a, 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 a monolithic reality. We're talking about a very uh, static, growing, moving reality because it was the black church that was at the forefront of most social change in this nation. And that same social change that was spun through the black church affected change worldwide. The same freedom songs that are akin to the gospel music of the black church stimulated movements throughout the world, right? Uh, be it South Africa, be it Czechoslovakia, uh, when the Berlin Wall fell, the song We Shall Overcome was being sung. Yes, sir. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so that speaks to faith. That speaks to meeting the needs of a people. A people meaning humanity, irrespective of culture, irrespective of race, which is also a man-made construct race. There is one race, a human race. We, in, we are interconnected. Like it or not, we are each other's keeper mm -hmm. for the rest of the, 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 the millennia that in which we live or, or survive as human beings, mm -hmm. right? So there is an interconnectivity to humanity that speaks not to religion as much as it speaks to our faith, our belief in something greater than us to do something greater than we want to do even, mm -hmm. right? And then we can go to the next step, which is calling. What is your purpose? Because that speaks to calling, right? I'm not simply here to go to a nine to five every day, uh, pay bills, raise kids, and die. There should be more to my existence. Absolutely. There is a there is a purpose for me. Every human being on this earth is called to something, right? which can go to the idea, the ideology of gifts. Everyone is not gifted. I love singing. I'm not the greatest singer, however. Hmm. Some other people have that gift to sing. Mm -hmm. I gotta work at it, right? Yes, sir. Uh, but if you're gifted to do that, and it becomes a passion for you, and it changes people, uh, there, there is a logical uh, belief that that is, in, in fact, one, if not your calling to affect change in this world based on that, that innate ability that you have to reach people where they live, right? Or where they are to pull them to a better place, or motivate them to a higher place. That whole reality is the black church, is the church not simply the black church, but the church. The most segregated hour in the United States is typically Sunday morning, where people go to what's familiar, what's comfortable. They go to where they practice. However, the most effective ministry occurs on Monday. Think about it. Where people receive what they need and go for on Sunday and then put to practice what it is that they receive on Monday in the workplace, in the larger society. 
Absolutely. And thinking of needs, and obviously worldwide we definitely need needs. But one need that is pops out, and of course you eloquently talk about the Central Family Center, which we've talked about and done great programs with, but still need to expand on mental health. Mm. Mental health in uh, urban settings is obviously um, urgent need due to a lot of taboos, myths. Mm. That many um, African Americans don't believe that they should go to get help, therapy, counseling, and so forth. We had a couple of shows about that previously on this network. But I want to get your take on it. I know that you are uh, you're one of the forerunners of bringing mental health through the community into the black church. Your thoughts on that? So this this is my take. Uh, you know, my dissertation deals with um, healthcare disparities, yes, right? Sir. And how healthcare disparities, and particularly of men of the diaspora, affect their healthcare choices. I do not blame the victim for the crime, right? Mm-hmm. I, I don't succumb to the um, to the thought that African Americans, um, in many ways, aren't concerned about their health, their mental health, their physical health. I subscribe to the fact that we live in a, a, a society where there are systemic practices that affect behavior mm-hmm. and change, right? Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to give you an example. Something as simple as the Pampers commercial, where you see babies. Mm-hmm. The, the Pampers commercial will start off with a beautiful baby, full face, beautiful cheeks, the rosiness, and the, he's crawling or she's crawling, and they talk about the effectiveness of the Pampers and how they work, and then you'll flash for a second to another baby, another baby, another baby, and then you're in with that beautiful baby that they started off with or a, a baby akin or similar to that baby. What is, what, what in my, uh, in my um, example is missing is that typically the baby is a European baby or white baby. The other babies that are quickly flashed to are brown babies or darker babies or maybe an Asian baby and then the last baby again. So you is a is a European or white baby. So you start off with a with a perspective or an image and you're in with an image. And in your subconscious, the most important thing that is left with you about that commercial is that in some way white is better than anything else. Now there's a lot of lot more to that. Mm-hmm. But that's the simplistic perspective of conditioning or mindset that I, that I want to share in answering you know that question mm-hmm. about health. Yes, sir. So there are health disparities. Doctors tend to listen more tentatively to patients who are not black and brown. Uh, th- there's a whole systemic reality as to why uh, black and brown folks do not receive the equal quality care that other people in this nation receive. And if that's the change, we have to deal and face these realities, right? It is not unlike the fact that until recently in every urban setting you had a Pol- Polish town or a Polak town and a, uh, you know, you know, you name a Chinatown, you know, a, a little this, a little that, because people go where they're most comfortable. Mm-hmm. So in our healthcare system, we must have culturally competent practitioners Mm -hmm. who can speak to all people Mm -hmm. with the same veracity, the same integrity, right? The same level of care, which today is not the case, Mm -hmm. right? Blacks are not genetically predisposed to living shorter lives than any other group. But if you're in a society where consistently you're under pressure, you are consistently uh, 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 suffering from food deserts, and you are consistently underpaid, consist all of those other systemic realities are negatively uh, impacting your life, your quality of life, not because of your doing, but because of the society, societal realities, then of course you're going to receive subpar services, be it healthcare, be it economics, be it the job market, 
you know, on and on and on. And then hypertension, the reason hypertension is, is a reality in most black and brown communities is because it is a result of living in a society that you that puts you under pressure on a regular basis. Now being cognizant of that helps the individual to overcome those realities. The black church has been our outlet and still will be, it is and will be our outlet because in there we can have the freedom of expression to cope with the daily realities of struggle. We still have a liberation gospel as Jesus did. We still have a perspective of uh, overcoming as did Jesus. We still uh, subscribe to the gospels that, that gives me my charge as a pastor to speak to the poor and to speak freedom to the captive and liberation to the oppressed, right? We still uh, uh, subscribe to the gospel that tells us when Jesus speaks to us ultimately, he's gonna say, where were you? And he said, well, where was I? When did you need me? He said, when I was hungry, did you feed me? Yes, sir. Uh, when I was naked, did you clothe me? Yes, sir. All of us who uh, to subscribe to Christianity at least, black, white, or, or, or in between, will face these questions, right? And so this is our mandate. Our youth can understand that, can relate to that. Our seniors can understand that, can relate to that. Middle uh, age folks who are working and raising families can understand that and certainly can speak to that. Mm -hmm. And that's when we talk about speaking truth to power, mm -hmm. right? Because our, sp our speak is really our doing. Yes, and when we are about doing it, Monday through Sunday, that's ministry. Mm -hmm. That's where sizable, meaningful change occurs, mm -hmm. right? I'd rather see a sermon than to hear one any day Yes, sir. Nothing wrong with hearing it because mm -hmm. it empowers me, but I want to see it. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by something bigger than me, the word of God, which is always higher to us, always calling us to something greater. And not just us as an individual, but those around us. Yes, sir. With that, with that thought and, and similarity as far as needs, we have a need obviously for domestic violence mm. which is also really prevalent in our communities and i know you, you spoke to a lot of different things that speak to that but specifically and, and we can specialize if we can fit that um again the same question to domestic violence how can how can a church as you will so um well stated can be that conduit that coping skill so to speak so, so just like when we talk about mental health in the black church mm -hmm. and how the church on sunday morning is our therapy. It is our therapeutic practice, right? Mm -hmm. It is our time to engage in worship. It is our time to engage in a, a, a release so that we can cope with the realities of the day. It is also the case with domestic violence. We have to speak to it and allow, in particularly men, while I will preface this and say that not only women are the victims of domestic violence. Men are as well. And it's a growing trend, quite frankly. But we now, especially in dealing with the uh, CMS, uh, Crisis Management System in, 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 in uh, New York, uh, and, and, and gun violence and, and various forms of violence, in our therapeutic models, models we've learned that the focus shouldn't solely be on the victim as much as it should be on the perpetrator because at some point, statistically, the likelihood is that the perpetrator, his or herself, were at some point the victim. Yes, sir. And so in order to break the cycle, we must have a identified focus on both the victim and the perpetrator. And then that whole notion of restorative justice comes in as to the fact that they're at some point in the lives of these persons, uh, a, an inequity occurred. And that we have to take time to understand 
the perpetrator as well as the victim so as to restore them to a sense of wholeness. The church does that. Mm -hmm. The church does that for a domestic violence uh, victim. The church does that for domestic violence perpetrators. Now, I will tell you why I know what I know from a very practical perspective. I pastored the church in the Bronx for eight years, seven and a half years, and we had a growing trend of husbands coming to church. I did a whole series at one point on for women in the church, and the series was called Loving Your Man. Mm -hmm. At the time, somewhat provocative, but uh, I was uh, given grace and the church worked with me. And through that series, a number of husbands started coming to the church, and, 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 and one husband, uh, in particular, who became a deacon at the church, uh, it was a somewhat, somewhat of a funny story. He started attending the church, sitting in the back on a back pew, and then slowly, you know, the third from the back, and and so forth and so on. We once ha we had a discussion on a Saturday, and he said to me, Pastor, I want to I want to talk to you now. But just before he became a member, and I said, Of course, let's let's talk. And he says, I'm going to tell you something. I started coming to this church because I didn't like you. I started coming to this church because I wanted to know what you were putting down. He said, my wife started coming home, and she stopped arguing with me as much. She was cooking meals. She was doing things, and I got angry hmm. because this is not the woman I married, nor was this the woman I was accustomed to. And, and he said to me, I, I thought you were brainwashing her and something was going on. He says, but the more I kept coming, the more I started understanding that this thing really is real and is really about love. Now, I said all that to say, this is, it is also the case that this gentleman was a perpetrator of violence in his home hmm. for a number of years. All of that ceased. And through time, an atonement took place, a reconciliation. Just because he was coming to church and they continued to live together as man and wife didn't mean they were really man and wife. But at some point, they reconciled. There was a rebirth, if you will, of that relationship. And in that, there was a confession of hurt, years of hurt, and also a confession that the only practical means for which he could overcome this hurt was to hurt those whom he loved. Mm. So that domestic violence wasn't just against his spouse, his mate, that thing affected their children and their children's ability to effectively practice love to their mates and their children. It was systemic, mm -hmm. but the breaking of those practices took work, took time, mm -hmm. took, again, the, uh, you know, the foundational reality of our faith must be love. You know, I, I said to the church I serve at now when I first got there, I'm not here to be friends. I'm here to pastor. And if friends come out of this, that's, that's an added bonus. Mm -hmm. If you allow me to pastor you, I'll be the best pastor I know to be to you. And you will teach me how to pastor you. Now, that's real. Mm -hmm. The core of that is still love, right? Because person's notion of love, person's notion of friendship, a person's notion of all of those social constructs depends on a person's experiences, right? But there must be a willingness to grow. So we start with the platform of my role is this. If I'm allowed to be more than this, then that's a wonderful thing. But if I'm not at the core, if you allow me to be this, this is what I can bring to you, right? Mm -hmm. Now that's a that's a relationship that is that is steeped on facts and truth, right? And you can only go up from there. Yes, sir. Versus me coming through the door talking about I'm everyone's friend. You can't be a friend to everybody because you can't know everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody's not going to allow you to know them, mm -hmm. right? But a pastor church relationship is a solid understanding, at least in the practices in which we our tradition comes Absolutely. from. Right. Mm -hmm. 
So that's understood. But it, 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 there's also uh, it's also understood that there's a, there must be a willingness on both both sides there mm -hmm. in order for that to be a reality, mm -hmm. right? To that point, sir, I have to tell the audience the great work you've done and, and a little to gun violence. Mm -hmm. You were the only pastor here in, in Staten Island that went to Chicago, discovered uh, the cure violence system of looking at gun violence from a medical point of view, brought the program back, and now it's flourishing. We've had lack of gun violence for almost a year in certain sections, our catchment area, due to base your innovation, innovative style. While that is great, how can we now expand? Someone thought you um, talked about earlier, can even expand and the church be part of still being anti-gun violence was still prevalent in our communities, and how can we move forward even more? So the, the, the notion of, of gun violence, while it is very, very, it has become a popular conversation and a horrible reality in all communities, the, the, the answer in mitigating gun violence is the answer in, in mitigating all forms of violence. It is true that what we call now uh, cure violence, the cure violence model, is really an epidemiology-driven model. That's a big word that simply means we look at root causes of behavior. So violence in and of itself is a result of a larger systemic reality. And typically when you deal with underserved, underrepresented communities, you're dealing with uh, um, persons who are acting based on the limitations of understanding. You can only use the tools that you have. Mm -hmm. And so violence is a tool. Mediating is a tool. Conflict resolution is a tool. Economics, upward mobility is a tool. Education is a tool, right? Stress reduction mm -hmm. practices are tools. Yoga, Taekwondo, Tai Chi, these are all tools in dealing with the realities of stress on a daily basis. So this model looks at root causes, and then we seek ways in which to change norms and behaviors on a systemic basis. And when you do that, you not only reduce gun violence, you reduce violence of all, all kinds, and then you not only change it for the perpetrator and the victim, you change it for their children and their society, the family, the larger reality. And so yes, we now are experiencing in Stapleton, um, over about, to, to date, 380 some days of no shootings and stabbings in our catchment area. And in Mariner's Harbor, a, a larger, experience of 800 and some days of no shootings and stabbings in what was formerly one of the most violent prone communities. Mm -hmm. So as I say often, you have more black and brown folks incarcerated uh, in the United States than we have people in some nations. And that's certainly not because black and brown men or women are born disproportionately uh, uh, violent or or in, in some way criminals. It's because of the system in which they're born in that is hell-bent on their demise. So if we can experience these trends in these communities, we can experience a change of trends, negative trends, in the same population across the United States of America, right? Because it is really about providing people who are, um, who are systemically um, not provided the same tools as other groups, providing them with the appropriate tools to live the American dream and to live up to, to the, the fullest of their potential Absolutely. in the society. Yes, and that's really what we're speaking to. And I know that's not a simple answer, but that's the, the answer for this particular question. So if we're talking about gun violence, we're talking about domestic violence, we're talking about any types of violence, we have to talk about understanding the people, loving the humanity, and Absolutely. a willingness to bring change, bring the appropriate tools 
in the construct or in the societal reality, in the trends and norms to affect that type of change. And doing it, watch this, from a culturally competent, sensitive perspective. Now that takes energy, it takes uh, a willingness, it takes resources, mm -hmm. right? And I will argue in the most effect, the, 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 the greatest society in the world, we have all of that. Yes, we do. We have to have the willingness from the power brokers to affect that change. Because guess what? What we don't tend to talk about, which I think we should, and that is when we take care of the least of them, we then affect positive change in all of them. Again, when we take care of the least of them, we then, as a nation, as a society, produce positive change for all of them. We need to write that down. That's a great quote. Absolutely. Matthew 25. Hallelujah. Excellent. Amen. Amen. To that point, it was a great thing. Um, like to follow up on, give me, give me some true on Shout to True to Life, which is our, which is our, which was, which, which, which is our program. And I will add that True to Life is filled with credible messengers. Mm -hmm. These men and women are the persons who actually affect change on the ground every day, at night, during the day in the middle of the day, who understands the language and the culture. And I'm proud of the fact that we are employing younger and younger True to Life is the name of our CMS program in Staten Island. We have partner organizations in every borough who do this work and do it extremely well and extremely credibly, young men and women. Thank God for them and their willingness. And my job on a regular basis is to make sure that they have all the tools they need to in fact tool and empower the community, right? So everybody has a role to play, interconnected. And my job is to make sure these men and women grow beyond this programming into other areas to do great work so that there can be somewhat of a turnover so that the younger, younger, younger groups are empowered to empower communities on and on and on and on, right? I, I'm going to throw this in um, and say one of the experiences that, that I'm experiencing here, and that is that there are powers that be that will attempt to undercut great work. And this is not new. This is this is old as humanity. Yes, it is. But what we are operating with is again a foundation of love, even in the workplace, dealing with communities that are under-resourced and under-nourished with love. So that when um, powers come in that attempt to undermine great incredible work, they are, they are buffeted by a wall, by a force that is greater than any other force, be it economics, be it black power, white power, all these other extreme measures that allow the work to continue. Because the goal, my goal, is I, I'm extremely transparent, both uh, personally and professionally. My goal is to build something that's sustainable and that will last well beyond my tenure. I'm just one cog in, in many, uh, in, in one spoke in, in a wheel that is much larger than me. So this thing can keep going well beyond my tenure. So we're not doing any CIA, FBI work. We're doing <laughs> real community work, you know? Yes. It's, it's not like you're in a classroom and you're taking a test and you put your hand, you know, the book is open. These are the questions, these are the answers. Learn them both so that you can flourish and others can flourish. Around you, as well says always, um, Pastor North Carolina. With that said, being who you are, and again, I, I, I wanted to tell the audience which work you've done, how you create the system, but also your your renowned educator. Those that have seen you in the pulpit, I've seen you in the pulpit. I've also been privileged to see you inside classroom. And great as a, a, a theologian you are, I think you're even a greater teacher. And I think as he would, and you're great at both. To the point, go to question of urban, edu urban education. Mm -hmm. Main of um, systemic things we talked about, mental health, domestic violence, gun violence, we see first start in educational level, the school level. As uh, we're in four or five different schools under your charge right now. 
um, CFLC and Central Valley Life Center, doing uh, dealing with those situations as we as we come to this new school year within a couple of weeks, September eighth, we'll, uh, we're going to unpack with Garvey Education, and we know we have a uh, due to the pandemic due to being shut down. So we have I want to say that we have fourth graders, sixth graders who really were fourth graders, and so forth goes on and on and on. Yet we still have to unpack. We still have to educate these young people. And I know church is playing a huge role, as it always has. Again, to those who are anti-church, I want to say the church was the first institution that, that taught black people how to read and write. So I think that's huge. And I know you're proponent on that. So your thoughts on urban education, education in urban setting, and how we can help with that. Wow. My thoughts on uh, education in urban setting, urban setting and how we can help with that. Well, as you articulated, we, we're in uh, four different schools. And I shout out to Eagle Academy. Uh, the last Eagle Academy in New York City yes, was uh, created, and I'm proud to say have graduated, now two years running, uh, graduates in Staten Island. That's right. As a matter of fact, Eagle uh, launched a school in Newark, New Jersey. Had a school in every borough in New York, with the exception of Staten Island. Uh, started a school in Newark, and and that was going to be it. But uh, to the credit, our present day um, chancellor, David Banks, you know, I went and met with him. And it's a funny story. I said to David, I said, you know, I'm just not going to leave your office until we come to an agreement that there's going to be an Eagle Academy in Staten Island. And David just shook his head and he says, you know, Dr. Carolina, if you can get support for Eagle in Staten Island, then we're going to make it happen. And to his credit, that's exactly what happened. And, and I'm telling you, uh, the, the school's doing great. And we're in uh, several other schools, uh, uh, middle schools and elementary schools in Staten Island, and we hope to be in additional schools as well. Uh, listen, urban education is, I, I want to say, is no different than any other education, but it is in, in the fact, and to the extent that there are more, more children to educate. But just like any other educational setting, we need educators who are willing to understand the children to whom they are charged and to take the information and make it tenable, palatable, uh, make it um, obtainable for the children that they're trying to reach. So that speaks to pedagogy, right? So our pedagogical, that is just the way in which we educate has to speak to the children that we are attempting to educate, right? There's a great move with our mayor in looking now at dyslexia because a large number of our children may not learn the same way as other children because they see the same information differently, right? Why is this important? We know that even in our prison system, most persons in our prison system system are illiterate or don't read well. So it starts at the elementary level and then works its way all the way through. And if we simply just pass kids and pass them, we do them a disservice. We know we've suffered now three years running with a pandemic. And so children have not been exposed to information. Let's operate based on that fact and not just simply operate based on a historic system that has failed our children. Listen, we have great educators. I just don't know that they've been given the best tools. No one's blaming our educators, but there has to be a conscious uh, acceptance of the reality that the system has not served the vast majority of our children Absolutely. effectively yes, and efficiently. I believe our present chancellor is speaking to that. We know that he has the tools because we see the results of an eagle and how the same kids who are in the same public school setting, and by the way, Eagle Academy is a public school. It's just that they look at the leader of that school they make sure that that leader is proficient and competent and willing to serve the students and that that leader brings to bear the same um, intensity in that entire school educational staff 
for the same students. And so ego experiences 90 some percent of all their students graduating. And of those, a high percentage of those going on to second, post-secondary schools of learning and or some types of skilled training, uh, trades training for their students. Well, if that can happen in an ego academy, it can happen in any PSIS school in New York City and beyond, mm -hmm. because it's really about speaking to the student. Now, we've experienced this, and we do experience this in school settings throughout the United States of America. But those teachers are aligned <coughs> to those students and so, to their parents and to that larger culture. The same thing should be true of schools and across this, the city. Median, if you look at statistics, the median educator in the United States is a white female between the ages of 25 to 40. Given that fact, if in your school system there are a large number of black and brown young men, you may or may not be able to relate to these young boys. Mm -hmm. We need more black male teachers, or at, at, at least teachers who are competent in educating these children, right? I'm certainly not saying that a white female can't educate a black male child. I'm saying there must be a desire to educate that child and a willingness to learn what cultural realities this child has experienced prior to coming to the classroom in order to effectively educate them. Two young men wrestling in a hallway is not necessarily aggressive behavior, but it can be viewed as such. And then these kids can be classified as problems. And then that classification follows them throughout their educational experience into their adulthood. And, here, and hence we have the uh, classroom to prison pipeline, All right? Yes, sir. These are, I, I've tried to take a very complex reality and make it as simplistic as I, I can possibly can. But that's the realities and when we speak to that whole urban learning environment. Absolutely. I want to say that you're part of the counter to that. We're in IS-49, Eagle, and PS-78. We've been working with great principals in all three schools. Absolutely. And we've countered that. We've countered that with the Saturday Academy after school program, Princeton Kings. And why these are programs, I'm speaking to these programs, have all happened on this man's charge, Dr. Caroline's charge, that we're speaking to everything he's talking about, putting into reality all these programs, mentoring, different things, uh, Taekwondo, whatever it is, whatever programs we, we he's talking about, we have right now. So, in the time we have left, though, I think that's an awful per perfect segue in that while we're talking to youth, bringing the youth back to the church, young people, young people, and we, have, we do a good job with generations here, I believe, right, millennials, but Going back to young people, this is what I've heard in my travels as, as a Baptist preacher. Um, Rev, you okay with me? I think you're a nice guy. But that church thing, I just don't know, man. And I'm, and I'm simplifying, as you said. I'm paraphrasing. And while on one hand, you laugh about it, but you say, this child should be in church. And we go back to, I know we spoke on last, our last session about Big Mama brought you to church back in the day. You was coming to church whether you wanted to or not. Absolutely. <laughs> that was the reality. That reality is not, is not happening. And I, and I am, my humble opinion, that speaks to everything we talked about of not being in that, in that setting. The setting that's, that saved us co coming up. Your thoughts on it? So the church is stagnant, again. Mm -hmm. The church is not just Sunday morning. Yes, sir. So we bring, whether they know it or not, we bring young people to the church every day of the week because we house programs in the church building. Come on. We have folks who love God and love people working in these programs with young people. People must see the church and not simply hear the church. And the church is never the building. The church is a congregated group of baptized believers in Jesus Christ. And the church can occur any day of the week. So how can we bring young people back to the church? By doing the work of the church and engaging and involving young people daily. That's how we bring them back to the church. Listen, time out for the traditional understanding of church. I love Sunday morning. 
I get my fuel on Sunday morning, and I'm going to keep going on Sunday morning. But Sunday morning is not all there is to my church, to my understanding of church, to the work of the church. There is church work and there's work of the church. And everybody who knows me knows I understand church work, but my focus is always on the work of the church, as was Jesus' focus. Everywhere he went, church occurred. Amen. And whether it was in a building or whether it was on in, in on a mountaintop or in the desert or God knows in the valley where we need church the most, work occurred. So I don't lose anything because people call me professor or people call me dean or people call me mister or people call me brother or people call me reverend or people call me pastor or people call me doctor. As long as I am doing the work of the church, hence the work of Jesus, wherever I go, church is there. It's powerful. Definitely, Jesus' work is definitely needed. So, to put a bow on this, to speak to urban apologetics, mm. and we, I think we, I think we hit a lot of great subjects, but to bring it to a put a bow on this and say urban apologetics, defending the faith in an urban setting. Your, your last thing to us. So I'm not going to have enough time to finish this, but I'll start it by saying this. When you see me, do you see Jesus? Hallelujah. When you see me, is what you see, do you understand what you see to be divine or to be human? Is what you see me doing something that is lifting building, inspiring, or is it something that is counterproductive? Am I speaking truth to power when you see me? Or when you see me, am I hindrance to your growth? That's urban apologetics. That is Christianity. That is spiritual. That is theology. That is my understanding of God. That's anthropomorphic, but it is also divine. So we can go into that a little bit more, but that's sort of the bow, if you will, for this whole discussion regarding urban apologetics. I have to say, Pastor, I, I'm as one of your one of your preachers, and you know I love your work, but this was a phenomenal setting, and I truly pray that everybody got something out of it. I want to thank you. Thank coming you. On, coming on the program Thank you again. For me. Yes, sir. We definitely want another good. We need another, another talk to Reggie and Kenny. We need a, a third of Stolman, I believe. <laughs> so, family, once again, you've heard profound words from a profound man, one of the great leaders of not only Staten Island, but the world. This is a world renowned leader who's come to you humbly and broke down complicated issues. But as we do, as he stated, we do always some love. God bless you. May God keep you. I mean, God take you to where you should be on your divine path. We say thank you. Praise God. Hallelujah.